In the third week of June 1940, the people of the Channel Islands found themselves facing a nightmare scenario. A scenario that everyone in Britain was fearing. A German invasion. Hitler's forces were sweeping their way through France and now had Britain firmly in their sights. After the evacuation of Dunkirk, the British army was now being ready to defend its own shores. The War Cabinet in London decided that the Channel Islands were of no strategic importance and so the decision was taken to demilitarise them. Along with the decision to pull the militia out of the islands, the Cabinet also recommended considering the evacuation of all women and children. The bailiffs of the islands addressed the people and announced arrangements for the evacuations. Now the decision had to be made by the islanders themselves. Leave or stay? Stories of what was happening in occupied France led many to naturally fear what would happen to them and their island once the Germans arrived. However, the decision to go wasn't necessarily an easy one. Leave all you have, all you've ever known for somewhere unfamiliar, not knowing where you'll live or how you'll get by. Or stay to face the enemy and an occupation full of unknowns. On Jersey, Lillian and Margaret Le Maitre were two young sisters who were ready to leave on the evacuation boats. However, their father wasn't prepared to give up his life on Jersey for the enemy. We were ready to go. We were absolutely ready to go. My father didn't want, I'm no. not leaving for a German, I'm not going to be pushed out of the house. So we didn't know. We and were then all ready. We were all ready and then... But we didn't go. We didn't know, so we decided it that at the last minute. Mm -hmm. Roy Pennell wanted to do his bit for the war effort and he and his family were also set to leave on the boats. But things didn't quite go to plan. I did consider going. I, uh, I was going to join the, um, the Navy and I was an electrician. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't want electricians. But I passed my medical uh, in, in St Helga's and I was waiting to be called up. And then the boats arrived to take everybody away. And we were going and my dad said... Uh, there was a queue a mile long, so we said, well, you know, why join the queue? So we stayed here. But my brother went. He was only 15 when he left, and he passed the um, medical. But they, he was a mechanic, and they, they wanted mechanics, but they didn't want electricians. So I got stuck. On the 27th of June, the Germans carried out a bombing raid on the harbours at St Peterport in Guernsey, killing 33 people, and St Helier in Jersey, killing nine. Roy Pennell and his friends had a very narrow escape during that raid. I remember when it was bombed, yeah, but that was mostly in St Helier's. But I was in the village here and there was, uh, along the, the road where the, the market, there was a market in those days, it's now a bank, and the planes came in and they machine gunned through the village here. So we laid down the other side of the wall and the bullets were hitting the wall. So, you know, we managed to get away with that one. Frightening though, when they come swooping down, you know, thank God, it wasn't a nice experience. But there wasn't a lot of bombing here. After that, that it went quiet once that was over. The attack sent a further message to the islanders as to how vulnerable they were after the militia had left for the UK and the islands had been left defenceless. Their demilitarisation had not been made public, and therefore, as far as the Germans were concerned, they still needed to be taken by force. Their reconnaissance pilots had reported spotting army trucks and lorries at the harbours of St Peterport and St Helier. In fact, what they'd mistaken for military vehicles were actually trucks carrying tomatoes to be shipped over to the UK. Three days later, just hours before their arrival, the Germans dropped an ultimatum at the airfield on Jersey. It ordered that a white cross was to be painted there, at the harbour and the Royal Square. As well as this, each house was to display a white flag. If these demands were not met, another bombing raid was threatened. Lillian and Margaret were full of fear as they watched the German troop transport planes fly overhead on their way to the airfield to begin their occupation. Their father was still in defiant mood. At our house we never surrendered. You oh, had, no. you had to <coughs> put yes. out a white flag oh, at your window. Yes. And it was a Monday, the 1st of July. Yes, right. And when they were just arriving. And yes, they were right. just arriving. Yes. And my father, he said, I'm not putting out a white flag. For any and German. I was terrified because yeah. we didn't have a flag up. But we never surrendered, did no, we? No, we didn't. And no. they didn't stop no. us. They, they, 
and the, the I was so frightened because the planes were flying over yes. the house yes. and we thought they're looking and there's no wife what are they going to do they're going to bomb us oh, no. but yeah. they, they, they didn't, didn't. But, yeah. and also when they were flying over we collected all our silver because we had silver in oh, the yes. family and we my father dug a huge big hole put it in a big case and we were burying all our silver in the garden yes. as the flames were going over yes, yes. Just hours later, life as the islanders knew it would change. Roy Pennell and his friends were shocked at what the Germans did when they first arrived. I was um, with some friends at the end of the, of the harbour here. When they arrived, they went to the first place they went to was the old courthouse. St. Dobens was the original capital. The first thing they did, I was with some friends on the green, which was in the air, and um, they shut up all the chickens. So, uh, you know, it was a bit, bit much, and they went in the pub and got all the booze and everything else. So we were advised to go home. And then, of course, we had to put white flags out on, on all, the, all the homes. With the occupation now underway, the islanders who remained had to get on with their lives, adapting to new rules, regulations and restrictions enforced upon them by the Germans. For some, adapting to occupation life was very difficult. Roy found the prospect of a long occupation hard to cope with. But the worst part, of course, I remember that must have been just after the Germans arrived. It seemed pretty hopeless for me. I, I couldn't see an end to it. I was probably 18 then, maybe 19. And quite honestly, I was walking along the bulwarks and we weren't allowed on the road. Uh, the road was a military zone, but the pavement, you could walk on the... But if you stepped off the pavement onto the road, you'd be arrested because it was military zone. And I thought to myself, well, I'm going to throw myself in the sea. I, I couldn't see an end to it. I was really depressed. It was a frightening experience. I, um, I knew it would go on for quite a while. I knew in my heart it wasn't going to finish overnight by any means. They really liked this island. With one German soldier for every three islanders, the Channel Islands were the most heavily guarded area of Europe. With that in mind, one might think resistance would be difficult, perhaps impossible, especially on small islands. However, there were islanders who organised and took part in acts of resistance. Although these acts were never going to be on a large scale, nor would they have any strategic value to the progress or outcome of the war, they were still important. They enabled the islanders to show their occupiers that they couldn't be completely controlled or suppressed that although much of their freedom had been taken from them, they would not simply sit back and accept an unwanted occupation. V for victory symbols were painted on German signs and in other prominent places. Underground newspapers were set up and German orders were defied. Even the youngsters on the islands were prepared to demonstrate their defiance. Lillian was influenced by her father's attitude towards the Germans and she too decided to ignore their orders. We had to walk to town, yes. and the Germans gave an announcement, this is towards the end of the occupation, saying that if any of the local people saw Germans coming along on the pavement, that they had to get off the pavement for the Germans. And my father said, I'll never get off the pavement for any Germans. And I listened to this. And I was walking through town going to school and there were two Germans coming along with their guns on their shoulders and I thought, I'm not getting off the pavement, I'll be like Dad. And one of them knocked me with his gun on my shoulder, knocked me straight into the road and just walked off. No damage was done. But it's just unbelievable that a girl in school uniform can be just knocked over by a couple of... It's amazing, really. In 1942, the Germans published an order banning the use and possession of wireless sets. Whilst many obeyed the order and handed their radios in, others refused and secretly hid them and continued to listen to and spread the BBC news to their fellow islanders. With the aid of their dog's basket and chimney, Lillian and Margaret's father took a huge risk in defying the order. We had a radio all through the occupation, hidden behind the dog's basket, 
And my one eldest, hidden up in the chimney. In the chimney. We lived in an old manor house, a very ancient manor house, with these huge granite chimneys. And my father managed to hide this, and then he used to stupidly to, um, write down the news as it came, got on a bicycle, because you couldn't have cars in those days, and drive around giving the news to all his friends in the parish. And we were terrified the Germans would stop him and search him, but he got away with it. It was quite amazing, really. Being caught in possession of a wireless, or spreading the news, could result in a lengthy prison sentence at best. However, there were some who were caught, who were deported to prisons on the continent, and never returned. Mrs. Renault was another islander who was prepared to defy the ban. Her husband had been killed overseas, and she decided that she wasn't going to do what the Germans wanted either. I had my, my uh, radio. We had to take them to the parish hall, and the, already my husband was gone. And I went up the hill with my, my radio, and I said, I'm not going to give it to them as well. So I came back down the field and put it in my loft and I had it. In another case where resistance rubbed off on the younger generation, Amelie witnessed her grandmother defy a group of armed German soldiers when they came knocking at her door. We were really sleeping. My grandmother didn't have the shutters up enough and, uh, or the black curtain. We used to have black curtains to think and there was light showing so they used to come down with about four or five of them in a thing with rifles and what have you, knocked on the door and said something. Um, and um, I was only, well, I don't know, four, I suppose, and I can remember my grandmother shouting out in, in German, which I can't now, which was, um, well, I can't remember the thing now anyway to say, go away or something. So with that, she just took the chamber pot from out of the bed and tipped it over and um, over to their heads <laughs> and <laughs> I can only remember this as, <laughs> as a child and um, told them to vamoose. With many shortages on the islands, footwear became increasingly difficult to get hold of. Wooden clogs were worn reluctantly by some of the islanders. These provided Amelie, then a young schoolgirl, with an opportunity to demonstrate her own defiance in the face of the Germans. I had clogs which were canvas wooden bottoms with canvas tops and things, and they were ever so nasty things, you know, gave you sort of what's names and bunions and God knows what else. And um, so I used to sling my, so I was five, I was at school, I used to sling them over the, the whichever place would take them actually, whichever garden. As I went down the Brettel Lane, I'd sling them away. And this German soldier said, came, and um, when I got to school, I hadn't got my clogs on. And he said, um, where are your clogs? And I said, well, I don't know, they're over there. So they went and found them anyway, and made me put them back on. The occupation tested the islanders' resilience and spirit in many ways. As well as restrictions imposed on their daily lives, they could also find themselves at the mercy of German orders at any time. In the latter part of 1942, as a reprisal for the internment of German nationals working against the Allies in Iran a year earlier, Hitler ordered the deportation of all British subjects who didn't have permanent residence in the Channel Islands and of all males 16 to 70 years of age who had not been born in the islands, together with their families. They were to be deported to Germany. Dan Murphy and his family were among those on the list to go. My father got um, a note from the German, uh, local German officer that we were to report the next morning with one suitcase to be transported to Germany. That was my father, my mother and myself. I was still in a pram. So they duly, you didn't disobey orders in those days. My father had an old radio which he had hidden in the house. We took the radio out into the back garden that night and broke it into bits and buried it because he thought if we went to, if we were shipped to Germany they found the radio we were in their hands and we'd probably be killed so um, we marched up to College House the next morning which was the Gestapo headquarters 
and uh, were told that because my father was an Irish national, in fact, we weren't going to Germany. So it was a situation where we then marched home and my father didn't know whether to laugh or cry because we weren't being shipped out, but at the same time he'd broken up his only radio. Others weren't so lucky. Just over 2,000 people, including children, were deported to three internment camps in Germany. Those who were deported for committing crimes were sent to prisons in France or Germany. Others ended up in the notorious concentration camps of Bergen-Belsen, Ravensbrück and Auschwitz, amongst others. The Jewish population in the islands, although reduced by the evacuation before the occupation began, suffered the same treatment as those under occupation elsewhere in Europe. There were 16 Jews in the Channel Islands when the occupation began. At least eight of them were taken to concentration camps and never returned home. But it wasn't just islanders who suffered at the hands of the Germans during the occupation. As 1942 approached, Hitler intended to make them fortress islands by constructing concrete defences to form an extension of his Atlantic Wall. The organisation TOTE, originally a small German government department in the 30s, was responsible for making Hitler's plans a reality. By the time work started in the islands, the OT had grown and shipped in thousands of men of many nationalities to dig ditches, pour the concrete and build walls. These walls, gun emplacements, bunkers and underground tunnels, some of which still stand today, are a reminder of their great sacrifice and suffering. Islanders were appalled by the treatment of the slave labourers. They were dressed in rags, marched barefoot to and from camp, except some perhaps with their feet wrapped in sacks, if they were lucky. They were malnourished, desperate for food and desperate to escape. In the second year of occupation, Roy Pennell and his mother were forced out of their house to make way for the organisation tote. They witnessed for themselves the brutality the forced workers were subjected to. They were really poor devils. They were, really were. You know, they, they marched them from St. Helena's Harbour. I used to watch them go through the village here. And some of them would just fall over and they'd be kicked until they got up again and started walking. It, it was cruel. At Wayne, where, um, which was my mother's home, uh, in 1942, I think it was, we had a, a reclamation order to say we had to get out and they, um, they occupied the place. So, and the organised church lived there. And there was a number of bungalows on the hillside, I think about 30 bungalows. And the, la the slave ladies used to escape and go and hide in these bungalows. So what they did, they blew them all down. So they were all flattened. I still got the requisition order at home. Some islanders took great risks in trying to help the foreign workers. They defied the Germans and tried to give them food as they passed through the villages. And some were even prepared to risk their own lives to give a safe refuge to those who managed to escape. Louisa Gould was one of those brave islanders who sheltered an escaped Russian. Eventually, Louisa was found out, arrested and deported. She ended up in Ravensbrück concentration camp and a selfless act for another mother's son the title of the 2017 film which depicts her story led her to the gas chambers. But Louisa was not alone. She was one of a number of islanders prepared to risk everything to help the workers. Mrs Renault also knew someone who came to the aid of an escaped prisoner. The farm I worked for, he had a Russian hidden in his loft over his kitchen on his farm. Oh, he must have been there for a couple of years. Probably let him out at night in the house at night. I don't know, you know. And uh, he was there, and it was it, it wasn't very high over the kitchen. He couldn't stand. As well as having to witness the suffering of the foreign workers, the changing face of their islands, and cope with the German orders, the islanders also faced other changes in their day-to-day -day lives. Time was altered to fit in with German time. Traffic was switched to the opposite side of the road. Occupation currency was introduced and lessons in German became compulsory for school children. Another issue which the islanders had to deal with were shortages. They came in many forms. Clothing, general belongings, shoes and fuels to name just a few. 
bartering became a popular feature in the newspapers as people looked to make the best of a difficult situation. Even things like tyres and inner tubes for bikes became scarce, resulting in many islanders using rope and hose pipes as substitutes. However, sometimes trying to make the best of it using makeshift alternatives was a risky business, especially with unsympathetic members of the occupying force nearby, as Roy found out. I had an accident on my cycle and on my tyres I had uh, rope because we had nothing else to put on, you know, there was no um, inner tubes or anything like that, so I found some rope and I had to get to town on my bike. So I came down the hill and the rope came off, caught round the wheel and uh, slung me over onto the road. And just at that moment the Germans were coming out with a horse and truck and one of the wheels went over my body and they didn't stop. And I managed to get back home and I'd had a, a crushed kidney. And of course I was hemorrhaging quite badly and there was no uh, anaesthetic at all. I always remember hearing the doctor say, he won't go the nice. But I did, I did, and after the war they showed me on the x-ray how it had healed. Uh, and I haven't had kidney trouble since. Towards the end of the war, things got much worse, and the population really began to experience the shortages that resulted from being completely cut off. Lillian and Margaret's travel to and from school was affected, as well as the school day itself, having to change. In 1945, there weren't any buses. You so to walk, walk to town from so Groville. Groville to town. Yes. And then there wasn't any heating, so we only had morning school and we had to carry all our homework back with us and do it in the afternoon. And even when we had the buses, the charcoal buses, uh, they couldn't go up some of the steep hills. So we'd have to get out and the bus would go up the hill and when it got to the top it would wait for us and we all got in because it was absolutely packed like sardines. More worrying was the situation at the island's hospitals where Margaret worked during the latter part of the occupation. Oh, that was grim because the last year we didn't have any heating, we didn't have any electricity, we didn't have any drugs left so we just nursed to the best of our ability, but it really was quite horrendous. But there we are, we coped with it all somehow or other. One grim thing that I remember in the hospital, um, one day a mother brought in a nine-year-old child with terrible pains in his stomach and the doctors had a good look at him and said, oh, this is an acute appendix he's got. And they said, well, we've got no anaesthetics we can give them. If he doesn't, we don't give him something, he's going to die. And my uncle, who was an anaesthetist there and lived about half a mile from the hospital, said, well, I've been keeping a bottle of brandy all during the occupation for when we're released so that I can celebrate. And he said, I'll go and get this, and if we pour this down, that'll knock him out and see what we can get. Which he did, and he took this, poured it all down, knocked that sladdy out. They operated, and it took ages, but he got on, and it was all marvellous in the long run. Yeah. They took over most of the hospital, the biggest part, so we were just put in the back and just managed in the back wards as best we could really, yes. The shortage which nobody, whether islander, occupier or forced worker could avoid after D-Day, was that of food. Everyone became solely reliant on what remained on the islands. When things got really bad, Lillian and Margaret's father went out to find what the land could still provide for them. I remember my father going out towards the end and gathering um, sting nettles and making my mother made sting nettle soup for us just to have something to we, eat. We had vegetables, didn't we? Was, yes, we yeah, there was vegetables. vegetables and potatoes. Yes, there wasn't we much of anything. No. About a slice of bread a day. Were we lucky enough? If we were lucky. If we were lucky, yes. yes. Yeah. So, but we did manage. Yeah, we managed. We knew we had to. Yes. So we managed. The Germans kept a close eye on the animals on the islands and recorded the number of livestock. It was illegal to slaughter farm animals during the occupation, but there were islanders who were prepared to break this law too, 
particularly when food was in such short supply. Mrs. Renault was one of those people, and she developed a crafty way of keeping her forbidden food hidden from watchful eyes. My sister lived in the country, and she had a, a little shed at the bottom of the garden. And you know, I, I used to buy the little pig, and she used to feed it, so we used to have her. And I used to wear her pants with, to kill the pig. We knew a man who would do that. And I'd take it in my Red Cross box on the back of my bicycle. So I used to have a Red Cross parcel with a piece of pork inside. Like Mrs Renault, some islanders were more fortunate than others. Working on farms or having relatives who did so made access to food a lot easier. Mrs Renault was lucky to have family, friends and jobs that helped to provide for herself and her little boy. I worked in the hotel so I used to be all right. They had plenty of food. So what they didn't use I could take home. And as I say, my brother and my brother-in-law were milk testers, so the farmer used to give them a bottle of milk so I could come and fetch it. Can you imagine? Money was short, and there I was with my little boy of 10 months. I used to put him with Granny and go to work. And I used to, I tell you, I used to go to work. I was working in a, in a hotel. I had a good job. But... I needed food, so I went back on the land with my sister and my brother-in-law. With food supplies in decline, whilst working on the farm, Mrs Renault found it very difficult seeing the Germans benefiting from all her efforts in the field. So she came up with a scheme to ensure she'd gain more from the work she'd put in. One day we'd been working on the farm and, and uh, doing the potatoes, my sister and my brother-in-law and I, the three of us, when I was going home, the Germans were taking our potatoes. There was a cart, yeah, the farmer who we belonged to, let them, allowed them to. They were carting our potatoes for them that we'd been working all day. So you know what I did the next day? I was still in the potatoes. Every time I got to the top of the row, with the road, I crossed the road and my brother had a shed. So whatever few potatoes I had in my basket, take them in the shed while well, I said I'll have mine as well. Things became very desperate in the islands. Maxwell Delahaye was a young child during the occupation years, but remembers one occasion towards the end when both islanders and foreign slave workers were faced with similar shortages. I remember one day one of the slave workers in the island got into our garden and started pinching apples. My father caught hold of the gentleman and threw him over the garden gate. Little did my father know that there was a German officer hiding behind a tree the other side of the road. But fortunately for my father, the German didn't object. In November 1944, the German military authorities gave permission for the bailiffs of the islands to send details to the International Red Cross of just how desperate things had become. The islanders were quite literally starving. At the end of December 1944, they received a very welcome late Christmas present. The Red Cross ship SS Vega made her way into island waters. On her first visit, she delivered almost 120,000 food parcels, just over 4,000 diet supplement parcels for the ill, 5 tonnes of salt, 4 tonnes of soap, a small amount of clothing for children and babies, and around 1,850 kilograms of medical and surgical supplies. The Vega continued to make trips to the islands to supply the civilian population with more parcels. Those visits were so desperately needed. By the time of the ship's second call, at the beginning of February 1945, the situation was still dreadful. The food shortages during the occupation meant that even cats and dogs were no longer safe. Family pets disappeared along with other animals on the islands, as the German soldiers and foreign workers searched for their own food supply. Finally, on the 8th of May 1945, the islanders received the news they'd been waiting so long to hear. Winston Churchill was to announce the German surrender and the end of the war in Europe. On hearing that the Prime Minister was to address the nation, celebrations began and crowds of islanders, including Lillian, headed into town to hear Churchill's address that afternoon.
I walked into town, it was a Tuesday the 8th. Yes. Beautiful weather, absolutely sweating hot. Walked into town, into the square, and everybody was there. Lovely. In that speech, one sentence stood out perhaps more than any other to the islanders who were listening. Our dear Channel Islands are also to be freed today. However, when it came to the official surrender of the islands themselves, the islanders were made to wait until the following morning. Although a meeting had been arranged offshore on board HMS Bulldog to sign the document of surrender, the German commander of the Channel Islands, Vice Admiral Huffmeyer, sent a junior naval officer with only the authority to discuss the terms of the surrender. He was sent back with a copy of the document and a message that only the properly accredited official must attend to sign the unconditional surrender. Before leaving, the junior officer explained that as it was not yet midnight, if HMS Bulldog and HMS Beagle remained in their positions, they would be fired on by the island's shore batteries. The two destroyers withdrew to a safe distance until the next meeting. Just after 7am on the 9th of May, the surrender document was signed aboard HMS Bulldog, lying just off Guernsey. It paved the way for the liberation to begin. Margaret would usually have been heading home from work that morning, but the sight that greeted her outside meant that going home was the last thing on her mind. I'd been on night duty all night, and looking out of the hospital windows, I could see our troops coming up and I'd rushed out, rushed down the road after them. I've never been so happy in all my life, which is wonderful. And remember Mrs. Renault, who decided to defy the ban on wireless sets three years earlier? When they went off, I had mine to put out the window and play a tune. To convey what life was like for every islander during the German occupation of the Channel Islands would be impossible. Each had their own individual experience and perspective. But from the words of those you've heard in this documentary, we can at least get some sense of what people had to cope with and how things may have been in England had the Germans successfully invaded and occupied Britain. <laughs>